Uh, this is good. So about six months ago, uh, we announced Alexa Conversations at Remars. And today we're excited to come back, tell you guys what we're doing in terms of conversational AI, and to also show you some of the progress we've made in recreating some of the skills that we've uh, done previously using our old dialogue management technology. I'm Josie Sandoval. I'm a senior product manager with Amazon Alexa. And I'm Justin Jeffress, and I'm a senior solutions architect at Amazon Alexa, and I teach people how to build uh, Alexa skills and how to design for voice. Okay. It's not very loud. Okay. Um, can you, he's got it. Testing, one, two, give me a thumbs up when we're good. Yeah, can you all hear all right. us speaking? Awesome. All right, great. Yeah, sorry, we're like super quiet because we've been partying all week, so. <laughs> Uh, bear with us. So we're going to start at a high, high level. We're going to talk about skills in general just a little bit. Uh, we're going to talk about dialogue management, give you guys some of the background and theory about why we're doing what we're doing. And then we're going to get deep pretty fast. We're going to go into actually creating skills using Alexa conversations. We're going to show some screens, some UI, uh, some code samples. Uh, we're going to show you some examples of the actual model training data we're using to create these AI models. So it's going to stay, it's going to start high, it's going to get super, super deep. We're going to try to bump back up and try to um, circle back around on why we're doing some of the deeper things that we're doing. Uh, who here is in kind of a leadership strategy role? A couple folks. Who here is like engineer, fingers on keyboard, making things happen role? Okay, so we're a little more on the engineering side, so that's good. Uh, the engineers will probably be a little more happy. Who here is actually a, like, um, like an AI machine learning person? We've got like Five. Okay, cool. Uh, so, like I said, uh, when we go deep, we're going to show like some code stuff, and so a lot of a lot of that may be uh, a little a little on the heavy side, but I think we'll survive. All right. Um, who knows what a skill is? What's a skill? Sweet. I, I feel like a few years ago we used to ask that, and there was like half the hands. I think it's kind of ubiquitous at this point, though. Who's built a skill? A few people. Has anybody published a skill? Awesome. Well done. Did you get free socks for it, sir? No? That's too bad. Missed the sock days. Uh, OK, so there's more than 100,000 skills on Alexa today. And those skills reach over 100 million Alexa-enabled endpoints. And for those of you who don't know what a skill is, essentially, if you can say Alexa does X or Alexa can do Y, X or Y is a skill. There are skills that are developed by external third-party developers through Alexa Skills Kit. And there's also skills that are developed by internal Amazon teams. So. We look at all of those as skills. I always like to show or talk about uh, some of the innovative things that folks are doing. So this is just kind of like some orthogonal uh, examples of innovation. Uh, first off, Ocado. They're a popular supermarket brand, online supermarket brand in the UK. And they're using voice to make it so that uh, visually impaired customers can actually do online ordering. I think that's super cool. Uh, we always look at voice as an innovation enabling technology or an in innovation enabling interface. And so I like to see this type of thing where folks that are traditionally underserved with existing technology can access that technology using voice. That's freaking awesome. Um, on the entertainment and gaming side, uh, Beat the Intro is combining not just voice interfaces and audio interfaces, but they're also pulling in like these social aspects, leaderboards, that sort of thing, daily challenges to create an experience that makes people come back over and over and over again. And the primary interface is voice. And then finally, um, Mobiquity created a voice controlled drone with commercial off the shelf products and Alexa as that voice interface. And it was super cool because they were able to say, drone take off, land, go left, go right, go forward. And I really like this example because as I think about voice and I think about where we are now, um, where we are now is, is pretty cool. You know, you can talk to an Alexa-enabled device, you can control your smart home devices, you can set reminders, you can do a bunch of stuff. But if we look at 5, 10, 15 years in the future, uh, I'm a huge believer that the interface for robotics will be voice, right? You're going to have a robot walking on your house at some point in time. It's not going to be controlled through an app. It's not going to be controlled through a keyboard. It's going to definitely be voice. And I love to see companies innovating in that direction and moving that entire uh, that entire concept forward. So if that's what you guys are doing, voice controlled robots, then uh, we should hang out sometime. So when we talk about experiences on Alexa, there's two big categories. There's one shot interactions, and these are interactions where uh, a user goes to Alexa, says, do a thing, uh, what's the weather, or set a timer, or something like that. Uh, and these are interactions where the user just gives one command, 
Alexa executes it and gives a response back that essentially says, I'm done, Con a confirmation. Um, the existing technology for building skills, which is based on modeling intents and slots to convert spoken language input into normalized uh, data structures to your back end of your skill, works really, really well for one-shot interactions. That's what it's really designed around. Uh, so if you think of, say, this middle one, uh, Alexa, turn off the kitchen lights, it's really easy to model a set of utterances that might uh, all normalize down to uh, an intent that's turn off lights with a slot that is kitchen, right? So that way you can tell which room you're talking about. And the existing tech works really, really well for that. However, where we see a lot of the innovation turning to in the next several years is around multi-turn interactions. So these are interactions where it's a back and forth conversation between the user and Alexa. And what you're able to do is gather more information from the user to make sure you can do a more rich and engaging set of business logic and deliver something more complex to the user at the end of this interaction. So these are cases where using current technology, you may model intents and slots for all these interactions, but you're missing a big part of it, which is how do you actually manage dialogue state? And that's where the current tech, which is really designed around these one-shot interactions, and you get a command or you get a direction from the user, and you're just going to execute on it and provide a confirmation back, we start to see some cracks in that system. So what we're going to do is we're going to watch a quick video of a multi-turn interaction, and then we'll break it down a little bit. Uh, by the way, I'm not sure if we'll be able to hear the video. So like, I think we've got a headset up here. If it stops talking, we're just standing here staring at you guys. Like, Wave your hands and tell us it's done. OK, cool. I'm counting on you guys, three in front. Alexa, what are the show times for Dark Phoenix on Saturday after 9 p.m.? Here are the show times for Dark Phoenix on June 8th after 9 p.m. Get me two tickets for 10.35. OK, two adult tickets for the 10.35 p.m. show of Dark Phoenix on Saturday, June 8th at Regal Cinnabar Palace Station will be $21. Should I book the tickets? Wait, how long is it? Dark Phoenix is one hour and 52 minutes long. Actually, what are the show times after 7 p.m.? Here are the show times for Dark Phoenix on June 8th after 7 p.m. Get me two tickets for the 705 show instead. Okay, two adult tickets for the 705 p.m. show of Dark Phoenix on Saturday, June 8th at Regal Cinnabar Palace Station will be $21. Should I book the tickets? Yes, please. You will receive an email from Adam Tickets with your tickets. Cool. All right, so I really like this, uh, this video because it seems super easy, super natural. On the surface, you'd be like, yeah, there, there's nothing really fancy going on there. Of course, it's going to work that way. That's the way it should work. Uh, however, there is some pretty complex things happening. First off, there's this whole concept of entity resolution and disambiguation. So in the first part of the video, the user says, give me two tickets for 1035. And then the next turn in the response that Alexa provides back, she says, uh, or recognizes that's for Regal Cinnabar Palace. So uh, what that's, what's happening there is the user is able to provide one piece of data, and Alexa is able to look at that piece of data and map to the entities that are the options that are presented, and say, OK, I only have one entity that has a matching property associated with this. So I'm going to assume this is what the user is talking about without requiring the user to explicitly say the name of that entity. There's also a, a similar situation, which we don't show in this video, where maybe there's two different examples with the same property. And then you'd have to go into disambiguation. So that'd be a case where Alexa would want to ask, do you mean Regal Cinnabar Palace or AMC Town Square? So that would be the disambiguation example. The second thing that's happening that's interesting is there's this concept of mixed initiative. So the point where Alexa is prompting, and Alexa is rolling through the process trying to get the user to a checkout, to the end of a checkout flow, um, and Alexa prompts, should I book the tickets? The user is able to come in and say, wait, how long is it? So rather than providing a response that is directly related to the question that was asked by Alexa, the user is able to divert the conversation and go where they want to in that conversation. And Alexa responds accordingly. And finally, there's this whole conversational context thing that is arcing through the entire conversation. So when the user comes back and says, actually, what are the show times after 7 p.m., the user doesn't have to say, what are the show times for Dark Phoenix after 7 p.m. That conversational context of what entity are we talking about 
is still floating around, and Alexa is able to reach into that context, pull that entity name out, and provide a response back to the user without reprompting which movie are you talking about. So in order to do all of this, it requires a system or a type of system that is di called dialogue management. And, or it's dialogue management is a system, a dialogue manager is the actual thing. And dialogue managers do really just three things at a high level. They maintain conversational state, they prompt the user to attempt to get to the next state, and they interpret the user's responses contextually. And the reason why I've highlighted attempt here is because you can't actually control what the user is going to say. So in that example, in that mixed initiative, where the user says, wait, uh, how long is it? That's a case where the dialogue manager attempted to prompt the user to get to the next state, but the user decided to take their own initiative and go a different direction. These things happen all the time, and a good dialogue manager can handle it. And the other point, part here, when I say interprets the user's responses contextually, think of a case where a user says yes or no to a confirmation. In order to understand what they're actually talking about or what is it actually uh, mapping to, you have to understand what is the question you asked previously. So it could be, uh, do you want to book the tickets? In that case, a yes is a confirmation. Or it could be, uh, what is your favorite band? In that case, you, the user could really like the band yes. It's a possibility. So we'll dive in just a little bit here and we'll talk about um, how these turns of dialogue get managed by dialogue managers. Here we have an example where you're in dialogue state A. And now we're going to start, by the way, we're going to start shifting into this pet match example that we're going to be showing later on that we're going to tear down. So we're in dialogue state A. Uh, we're going to prompt the user, do you prefer high energy or low energy dogs? And we're attempting to get to the user to dialogue state B. And in this case, the user's response actually carries us from state A to state B appropriately. This is a single turn, and this is kind of the nuclear element of, uh, of a dialogue. If you take this example and you string out uh, multiple turns, you get a linear multi-turn dialogue. And this is a case where the user is bouncing from state to state to state, Alexa is prompting, and the user is responding in a way that you want, and you get to the final end state at the end of turn six, and you can provide a recommendation or some result back to the user. This is super easy to design for. It's actually super easy to do. Uh, there's not a whole lot of complexity here. This is kind of the same thing that you run into if you call like a help center and you get a phone tree, that sort of thing. Um, the main problem with this is, even though it is easy to do, it's kind of a crummy customer experience. It doesn't allow a lot of flexibility. What we see over and over again is that users actually want to do something more like this. So you get this complex kind of multi-dimensional state map that's not linear anymore. It's, it could be two, three, four, eight, 12 dimensional. Um, and what happens is as the user's navigating through these states, you have to find a way to keep prompting them to get to some end state, get them where they want to be. In this case, we can see on turn one, we prompt the user to get to the, the second state, and they answer with what we expect, so that's great. On turn two, maybe the user provides more information than we asked for. Or maybe the user says, you know, wait, how long is it? And it jumps you to a completely different state in the state graph. And a good dialogue manager actually enables this and allows the user to land wherever they're going to land and continue to prompt and move forward to the end of the process. Also, if you look at dialogue uh, uh, turn seven, this is an example where maybe the user corrects information that was provided in the last turn. So you might have a, a confirmation and the user changes the time or the day, uh, or if we're talking about our pet match example, maybe the size of dog they want, and then you're gonna take that new information and just find a way to deal with it and move the conversation forward. This is where all the complexity comes in, and this is where on the Alexa AI team, we're trying to figure out a way to like up-level uh, all of the experiences so that users come to expect this type of flexibility. The old way of designing for this uh, looked a lot like this, so you kind of end up with these very, very complicated state graphs. And uh, this is hard to read on purpose because I don't want you to actually look at it. Or if you take pictures, I don't want you to be able to like, read the pictures later. I just want you to see it and see that it, it looks bad. Right? The problem with this is if you're trying to design all the possible supported dialogue paths, you find out pretty quickly that you can't design for the flexibility you need. And so you start creating these hemmed in user experiences to keep the user from bouncing out of them. Um, the way that we're looking at doing it now, which is uh, more conceptual, we call situational design. So situational design tries to take a step back from understanding all the possible paths that somebody will move through a conversation and say, okay, thinking back to that multidimensional state graph, we have these points, 
and we know we want users to be able to land in any point they want to, and we want to pick up and move forward, let's just consider the design around those points. So we'll say, we'll take a user input, and we'll take conversational context, which is all this data that we've collected through the conversation, and we'll smash those together to produce a response. And that response is either a final fulfillment response or a prompt to get to the next state. In practice, the way it looks is something like this. So here we have a user input. In this case, it's an utterance where the user is saying high energy. Once again, we're getting back into our pet match example here. And we have this other data that's floating around in context. So we may have already a size preference, a temperament preference. We may also have user data. What's the user's name? Is it their third time using the skill, et cetera? Have we already recommended a certain type of dog to the user? We combine those, and then we run some skill logic, some business logic. In this case, we're hitting an API and we're pulling back a dog breed recommendation. So that also gets stuffed into context. And we take those things and we smash them up against a, a response management system to generate a response back to the user. And the response management system may provide a final fulfillment response, like in this case, or it might ask for another piece of information. So now we're going to start diving into PetMatch to show you how we actually build these things and then what we're doing to make them better and easier with AI-driven dialogue management. So, PetMatch uh, was kind of a state-of-the-art example of dialogue management that we presented at reInvent in 2017. So this was two years ago. It did some really great things. One, it had entity resolution, which was the ability for the user to come in and say a natural response. So it, let's say, for example, you ask, uh, what temperament of a dog do you want? A user could say, I want a lazy dog, or I want a low energy dog, and all of those responses would resolve down to a canonical value that you need to run your business logic. So it allowed users to respond in a more natural way without forcing certain fixed words to respond to questions. So that was really cool. The other thing it did is it used dialogue directives, and dialogue directives allow you to kind of draw a box around certain parts of your NLU model to expect certain types of responses when requesting information. So in a typical intent and slot model for modeling a skill, uh, all of your intents can be triggered with equal weight at any given time. When using dialogue management, you kind of draw a little box around it and you say, I'm expecting something right here. And that allows you to reduce him on a backend code that you have because you don't have to handle all the possible scenarios. Um, and essentially, PetMatch just walked a user through a multi-turn conversation to make a dog read recommendation. And it's actually uh, available on GitHub right now. So if you follow this link, you can pull down all the artifacts for PetMatch. It includes back-end code and model data, and you can build it and play with it yourself. So here we go. We'll watch a quick video of the original PetMatch experience. And button. Cool. Alexa, open PetMatch. Welcome to PetMatch. I can help you find the best dog for you. What are two things you are looking for in a dog? I want a big, friendly dog. Do you prefer high energy or low energy dogs? I want a lazy dog. So a large family low energy dog sounds good for you. Consider a great game. Alexa, how about a small lazy dog? What temperament are you looking for? Friendly. Do you prefer high energy or low energy dogs? Low energy. So a small family low energy dog sounds good for you. Consider a Bolognese. Okay. So just try to remember that experience in the second half where we went through. The first part works great. Provided some information. I was able to use some natural words to describe what type of dog I was looking for. All of that was normalized back to canonical values. Business logic ran. It was all great. But on the second half of it, as a user, when I try to correct something or make a change, it kind of kicks me back through the same loop again. And I have to start over and walk back through providing the information I already provided. So just remember that experience, because we, as we get into the version that we're building with Alexa Conversations, uh, you'll be able to tell where the benefits are from a CX standpoint. So now I'm going to turn it over to Justin. He's going to talk about PetMatch. He's actually the guy who built it. All right. So hopefully you all can hear me. Um, raise your hands if you can. Great. Awesome. So yes. Uh, a couple years ago, 2017, for reInvent, I worked on building PetMatch. And essentially what's going on here is we're having a conversational uh, multi-turn dialogue to collect three different slot values that we need in order to determine uh, what is the best match for our customer. And so the three things that we're looking for are a size range, which is, could be tiny, small, medium, large, 
Uh, and then we have a temperament, which could be a family dog or a guard dog. And then we have an energy level, which could be low, medium, or high. Uh, we had some support for things like synonyms, so someone could say something like a lazy dog, which would be low energy. We could also say some fun things like, I want a dog that fits in my pocket or purse. That could be like a tiny dog. Um, and so we had this bunch of different um, synonyms that could handle all these different types of natural ways that people might refer to the different slot values that we're trying to collect. That gives our model some more flexibility. Um, we had six intents, but the bulk of the work was uh, put into the pet match intent. And we had about 402 lines of custom Lambda code that we were using to handle all of the dialect state management, the disambiguation, and following up with uh, extra questions that we needed if we didn't get all the information that we needed from our customer. So what were some of the challenges that we had with pet match? Well, first of all, our CX was quite brittle. Uh, when I first, first got this working, and I was really proud of it, and I grabbed my colleagues to show them, you know, hey, check this out. One of my colleagues, the first thing they did when they opened up the skill was say, I don't want a large dog. And I went, ah, you broke it. I didn't expect that. So my model is as only as good as I pre predicted my user to uh, speak with my skill before I uh, build it and uh, let them play with it. So every single time I discovered an edge case, I had to go back and update my interaction model. And so over time, my interaction model got more and more and more complex. And with each update to my interaction model, I had to then go back and add more code to my backend to handle these edge cases. I also had to manage all of my state. Uh, and then I had to learn how to use dialogue directives because when you use dialogue management in the current paradigm, uh, you turn on dialogue management in your front end and then your back end has to return a dialogue directive in order for, Alexa, for the Alexa service to go through and continue to prompt the slots that you don't have yet collected. So now let's take a look at how we're going to be building pet match with an AI-driven dialogue management, which we're calling Alexa Conversations. So Alexa Conversations is a new deep learning approach to based approach that enables developers to create more conversational experiences. And the three main goals for Alexa Conversations are to achieve more natural human-like conversations. You end up with less backend code for dialogue state management and less model training data. So these are the three main goals of Alexa Conversations. So here we're representing what is a typical thing that your skill is managing at runtime. So everything that's in these black circles are things that your skill, your code is in charge of handling during uh, one of the turns during an interaction with your customer and Alexa. And the blue circle there is what the Alexa service is handling for you. This is for the current paradigm today if you're using dialogue management. So what's happening here, what Alexa is doing for us is handling the user input. So you create a model which determines how, where to map different speech to an intent. And then the information that your skill needs receives you know, what intent was called and any slot values that you define that you need. And then you're in charge of keeping track of the conversation, conversational context. So that's everything that you've collected up to that point. Um, and then you have to you know, create your own skill logic, and then you have to have a set of responses. And these responses could be things like, um, you know, what's the result of the match? Uh, if, you're not, if you haven't uh, collected all of the uh, slot values that you need yet, this could be the questions that prompt for the next missing slot value. It could also be uh, any error messages that you may have. And then you're also in charge of looking at and keeping track of the environmental context. And so this could be anything like, what time of day is it? It could be the location of where your user is. It could also be um, maybe this is their first time interacting with the skill versus their fifth time interacting with the skill. If it's their first time, that's going to change uh, your response because you're probably going to be a little bit more hands-on with your users, whereas if it's their fifth time, tenth time, a hundredth time interacting with the skill, you can be a little more brief with, with your responses. So all of that stuff comes together and that determines the response that you're going to give to your user. So now I'm about to change the slide to what it's going to look like at runtime when you're using the AI-driven model or Alexa Conversations. So keep your eyes on the slide and see which ones turn blue and which ones stay black. So I'm going to uh, count down. So three, two, one. So with the AI-driven runtime, the things that we're going to be responsible at runtime is basically handling our business logic, our APIs. 
So electric conversations isn't just going to magically do this for us. Uh, we have to train the AI to handle this stuff for us. And so the way how we're going to do that, I like to break it up into these five different steps. And so we're going to start off with creating sample dialogues. And these just uh, I'm going to go into detail about these, but I'm just going to give you a high level uh, explanation on this slide. So we have a sample dialogue that represents our conversation. Then we're going to identify the things that we need to collect. Those are called entities. Then we're going to define our business logic and our APIs. Then we're going to create our set of response templates, which is going to determine how Alexa responds to our user. And then we're going to take those four things, combine them together, and create an annotated dialogue. And we're going to look at each one of these steps in detail. So when we build PetMatch, uh, you know, we start with our sample dialogue here. So the user says, I want a large family dog. So in this one sentence, we've given two of the required entities that we need, a size and a temperament. And so Alexa Conversations goes, oh, we're missing one. We're missing the energy. So it responds by asking, do you prefer low, medium, or high energy dogs? Our, our user responds low, and our skill comes back and says, OK, in that case, I recommend a chihuahua. Now, some of you, I think, may have noticed chihuahua is not a large dog. And that's, we did that on purpose on this slide. That's a call out to us that we need to hook our API into this. And so when you're looking through our slides, once we've actually uh, hooked in our API, we're going to actually return the correct response there. So pay attention. Um, so how does this work? So this is a good representation of what's going on between uh, our customer experience, Alexa Conversations, and our skill endpoint. So when our user says, I want a large family dog, uh, Alexa Conversations determines, oh, we've got two of the three entities that we need. And so it's going to elicit for energy. Then once our user comes back and says low, uh, Alexa Conversations determines, oh, we have the three required entities that we need. So we're going to call the skills endpoint, and we're calling the specifically the get recommendation uh, intent, or not intent, sorry, API. And then our skills endpoint will receive that, do what it needs to do, and return back a data structure that LX Conversations is going to unpack and use a response template to say, OK, in that case, I recommend a Great Dane. So that's how this is going to work. So let's take a look at how we actually define our conversation here. And so this. A uh, bit of the part that's uh, it wrapped with a start and end, that is actually what we start with when we're starting to map out our conversation and train the AI. We create this uh, turn by turn, um, basically kind of like a Hollywood script. So we have U colon, which is what the user says, and A colon, which is what Alexa is going to say. And so this represents a one, like an end to end interaction between our user and Alexa to achieve the task that we're trying to do here, which is recommend a dog. So then once we've defined our sample dialog, which we also refer to as surface form dialogues, we need to then identify what it is that we need to collect. So we're going to go through here, and we're going to identify large, family, and low as entities that we're going to collect. And these are singular entities. Uh, and then we also have a, our Great Dane, which is another type of entity. And this is going to be a compound entity. So what's the difference between a singular entity and a compound entity? So uh, our single entities basically represent a single thing that we need to collect from our user through speech. So we're going to be collecting our range, size range, our energy, and our temperament. And a compound entity represents a set of entities. And this is typically, we use these to represent a data structure that comes back from an API. So if we unpack our recommendation result, it actually contains these four properties. We have a recommendation, and then we have size, energy, and temperament. So our um, API is returning the information that was sent to it along with the uh, result that it gave back. It's a way how to check and make sure that we didn't cross up any data on the way through. So once we've defined our entities, then we can go through and define our API. And so this is what our API looks like. So we have a uh, get recommendation, and we have a set of arguments that we defined, which are three. And these are required. We have our size range, our temperament, and energy. And then we set our return to be the recommendation result entity. And that's that data structure that's going to come back from our skills endpoint. And then we have our templates. And we have two different types. We have our response templates, and then we have our request templates. So what's the difference between these? I think you know, showing in context really helps solidify what these are. So on this slide here, you can see we have four templates. And we only have arrows drawn from two of them to our conversation. And that's because Alexa Conversations was able to automatically recognize that we're not going to need the request temperament and request range uh, templates in this uh, conversation, because in the first turn of the, of the dialogue, our user said large family. So we already have the temperament, and we have the size range. 
So then Alexa Conversations is going to use the request energy template to request uh, the, um, the range, or sorry, the energy. And then we're going to use the notify API response get recommendation response template to then provide back the, re the correct response. So let's take a look at the anatomy of a response template. So you can see here for our get recommendation, we have a set of formatters, and you can have multiple. In our example here, we only have two. And the formatters are comprised of a where clause and a template. And so you can see the where, what we're doing here is we're just checking to see if we got a recommendation result and if that recommendation result contains a recommendation. And then if so, we're going to use our template here that says I recommend A, and then we're using dollar sign uh, curly brace to have Alexa Conversations replace the actual result that we received back that's contained in our recommendation result into this sentence here. And you can actually define multiple templates. And what will happen is Alexa will, Alexa Conversations will randomly choose one of your templates that's in that formatter set. Uh, so that way it doesn't come across as robotic. Your skill's not gonna be repeating the same thing over and over again. Uh, we also have in our formatter, our second formatter, formatter two, we're just returning true and that's going to be our default handler. If we were gonna go to production with this, we would probably not wanna to default to always recommending a Chihuahua. If, um, if we had like errors and stuff, we'd probably wanna add a couple more handlers for that. Um, but you can see how simple this is to add various uh, varying responses depending upon uh, the result that comes back from your API. So now that we've uh, gone through the first four steps, the last step is to combine our sample dialogue, the entities, the API, and our response templates, and annotate our dialogue. And after we've annotated our dialogue, our annotated dialogue looks like something like this. So you can see there's looks like there's a lot of stuff going on here, but we've color coded this so it's kind of easy to understand what it is that we're referring to here. So everything that's in orange is the entities. Everything that's in red are our request templates, our response templates. And then everything in green is our API calls. And so if you look at the very first sentence inside that start and end block, we're saying, I want a large family dog. So we're able to read uh, what the user said. But inside of each of our brackets, what's going on here is we're saying that large is an entity of type range, and we're going to save it into a variable called range zero. Now, we're not hard coding range to large. What we're identifying is expect that what the user says here is going to be of an entity of type uh, range. So if our, if our user says uh, tiny or small or little, it's going to be saved. It's going to be recognized as a range entity, and it's going to be saved into range 0. And that allows us to keep track. Saving it into that variable range 0 uh, allows us to keep that context in memory and keep that conversational context. Uh, then if we go down to the second line, we have NLG and request energy energy. That's our template that's going to be used to uh, track all of, uh, or sorry, that's what Alexa is going to, to say back. If you notice underneath that line, it says, do you prefer low, medium, or high energy dogs? We're not actually going to read that. Alexa is going to read the result of running that template. Uh, and then once our user says low, that's going to get saved into the energy uh, entity. Uh, and then we are going to call get recommendation. If you notice, there's named parameters here. We have temperament, energy, and range, and we're passing temperament zero, energy zero, and range zero, and that's gonna be saved into recommendation result zero. And then on the next line, we have notify API response, get recommendation, and we're passing as a named parameter recommendation res result zero. And so Alexa's not going to read, okay, in that case, I recommend a Chihuahua. She's going to read uh, the result of running that template beforehand. And so what I like about having those uh, plain English values in the annotated dialogues is that you can come back later and read this and know, oh, this was what my sample dialogue was. So the sample dialogue remains, but all of the instructions that Alexa Conversations needs in order to do this stuff for you on the fly uh, is there. So you can take a look at that and understand what's going on. So let's take a look at some of the early results that we had while mapping over and re-implementing uh, pet match into uh, Alexa Conversations. So the original pet match had 605 lines of interaction model uh, and 402 lines of backend code. And when we implemented it over line for line for features, we had a 33% re reduction in code and modeling data. And what's really great about this is our backend code went down to 181 lines and we were able to separate eight out uh, our business logic from our uh, presentation logic. And so our backend is essentially just becoming a microservice that takes in inputs and returns outputs and the Alexa Conversations figures out what to do with it. 
Now it looks like there might be a whole lot more going on here because we have a bunch more colors. We've got uh, our samples, we've got our entities, our APIs and our templates, but uh, we get a lot of extra stuff out of this. And so, in fact, I'm gonna show you a, uh, a new video uh, that shows Alexa Conversations uh, implementation of PetMatch and see if you can figure out one of the new features that we added to this and we got for free just by using Alexa Conversations. So I'm gonna go ahead and play this video now. Alexa, open Better Match. Welcome to Pet Match. I can find the best dog for you. What are two things you're looking for in the dog? I want a big, friendly dog. Do you prefer low, medium, or high energy dogs? I want a lazy dog. So a large, low energy family dog sounds good for you. I recommend the Pyrenees. What about a small dog? So a small, low energy family dog sounds good for you. I recommend a Papillon. Stop. Bye. So, so that's super cool. We were able to use less code, less training data. <coughs> Excuse me but get a better CX. We got that whole loop where I go in as a user and say, how about a small dog or even a smaller dog? We got that for free. We didn't really have to do any training for it. Just the fact that we provided that initial surface form dialogue that expected the user to go through, request some information, and we use that and we drop it into this AI simulator layer that takes it and extrapolates out to hundreds of thousands of possibilities. We were able to get that CX without really even having to think about it. As a matter of fact, you'll see this as we go further along, the, the CX that's supported is much more flexible as we add more and more features because we don't have to consider all the possible paths that a user will take through that skill. The AI layer is anticipating them for us, which is really, really cool. However, the, the one thing here that I want to point out, even though we're saying uh, less back-end code equals less complexity, we don't necessarily care about that because we are deeply invested in how much code you guys as engineers write. That's completely up to you. You can do what you want to do. What we actually want is for you to use the same amount of effort to create a better customer experience. We want to make it so that you who are already delivering goods and services and products and experiences to users through other channels can as much as possible leverage the APIs that you already have, pipe those into Alexa and focus more on making it a great customer experience. So because of that, we couldn't just stop with like, great, we did pet match, now we can like go and do a quick turn and get a smaller dog. That wasn't good enough. We decided to take it to the next level. Yes. So how do we take it to the next level? Well, we did a couple of things. And one of those things is extending pet, ma pet match with APL. Um, who here is familiar with APL? Raise your hand. OK, so for those of you who aren't, APL stands for Alexa Presentation Language. And it's a way how to take advantage of Alexa-enabled devices with screens and to supplement the experience with visuals. And so let's take a look at PetMatch then versus now. So with the old version of PetMatch when we were using dialog uh, management, dialog management doesn't support sending back other directives along with your dialog directives. So you cannot send back an APL directive in your response, which means you can't have visual aids during the multi-turn dialog. So now with Alexa Conversations, Alexa Conversations doesn't care what directives you send back because you're just sending back data, a data structure. And we can also, when we go to set up our templates, we can define uh, that we're going to uh, need an APL document rendered, and it will handle basically inflating our data structure into the APL document and rendering it for us. So this is really great. And it also separates our business logic from our presentation logic, because in today's current world, if someone is implementing APL Typically what they do is they have a folder of all their APL documents uh, in their Lambda code and then programmatically they load it in and then they uh, do the data binding themselves and then send over as part of a, uh, the directives that comes back from their skill to the Alexa service which then gets rendered. So it, it simplifies that process for us. So we created some simple screens for uh, pet match and I want to call out our uh, results screen there. We're able now to have a picture of our dog, uh, a description, and then we added some more data. We added uh, the amount of shedding that it has, you know, just in case some people have uh, highly allergic to dog hair. 
uh, they can know if the dog is hypoallergenic or not. So where does this uh, APL stuff plug into this process of creating all of the training data for our skill running with Alexa conversations? Well, for both our launch and our question screens, we're going to use our response template. We're going to update our response templates. So if you remember earlier, I talked about the anatomy of the response templates, and I hit upon the where and the template part. But there's also an APL part that you can define. And uh, what you all have to do here to get your APL document to appear is just to provide an APL document name in the APL field in the user interface. And so what you're going to do is you would actually go to the APL authoring tool, create your document, export it, then import it into your project into the uh, Lex Conversations model, and then collect it or set it here with the document name. So that works great for our launch screen and for our question screen, but what about screens that are more dynamic, right? Like our results screen is going to be a little bit uh, more dynamic because we're not going to be able to hard code the results. So for that, we're actually going to have to update our entities, uh, possibly our business logic and APIs, and our response templates. So we're going to start with our entities. So if you recall, previously our recommend recommendation result entity looked like this. We had four fields. <laughs> We're going to go ahead and add three more fields to it. So we're going to add our image URL, our description, and the shedding information. So we've just updated that. Uh, we might have to also go back and update our API for pet match. Our API already returned this information for us, but we weren't using it. So we didn't have to do any work there to our backend code. So now how do we display the image and other data on this uh, template? Well, we're going to use data binding. And APL is, or sorry, Alexa Conversations is going to do that for us. So in our APL document, we define our data source as payload. And then since we've used a recommendation result as our entity uh, with Alexa Conversations, we can just refer to it here in our APL document and then refer to the image URL. And then at runtime, once our data gets sent back to Alexa Conversations and it's going to use our response template, it's going to unpack this data and replace source with the actual image URL. So next step is to update our API. And actually, we don't need to update our API because the reference to what we're returning, the recommendation result, didn't change. The underlying data structure changed. And we made that change when we updated the uh, entity uh, in Alexa Conversations. But we didn't change anything with our API. So we get that for free. And then our response template here, you'll see we just go into our formatter and we select result page, which is the name of our APL document that we created. So in doing so, now Alexa Conversations will automatically unpack that data and um, basically do the binding for us. And so when we speak to the skill and it gives our recommendation, we get both the description of the dog and we get or sorry, we get the uh, announcement of what the recommendation is, and we get a nice little visual uh, element displayed on the screen to help users see what actual dog that they got matched with. But we didn't stop there. What if our user wants to see more images of the dog? So we've updated our uh, sample dialog to uh, have another turn after, uh, the user said, after we give the user our result. So our user can now say, show more, more pictures. And Alexa's going to respond by saying, here's another picture. And then we have uh, our screen there with a nice picture of our dog. So to update our recommendation screen, what we would do here is we're going to create a new entity called a picture result. And our picture result is going to contain the URL of our new image. We're going to create a new API called get picture. And that's just going to be something that uh, we pass our picture result. Sorry, we don't need to. We we're actually going to pass our recommendation result to our uh, API. And then we're going to have our response that takes the picture result from our get picture API. And we'll take all of that and annotate our dialog. So let's take a look at our newly annotated dialog for more pictures. And you can see here, the top part is pretty much all the same as what we saw before. But the new part comes in after we say, show me more pictures. So we have a template that recommend. Uh, that it's called show pictures that uh, is going to train the AI that for more possible ways that a user could say show me pictures. They could say like, I want to see more photos. I want to see 
uh, you know, more than, like, there's more than one way that they could say show me more pictures, and so that's what that show pictures is going to do. Then after that, when we call get picture, we're passing the recommendation result zero, which we got a couple lines above uh, when we called get recommendation. So we're just gonna pass that straight in, and we're gonna return a picture result. And then the previous, the, the next line under that with the NLG notify API response get picture, we're gonna pass picture result zero into that, and that's gonna have Alexa say, here's another picture, and it's gonna render the picture on our APL document. So this is really, really cool. We were able to do a whole bunch of great stuff with uh, very minimal effort here. I'm gonna show you another video that shows these two features in action. And due to the fact that we were limited by time, we weren't able to go through every single thing that we updated uh, PetMatch with, but you'll be able to see those things happening in this video that I'm going to show. So pay attention and see if you can recognize some of the things that we're able to handle now that we didn't yet talk about through this uh, presentation. So I'm gonna go ahead and click play. Alexa, open Better Match. Welcome to Pet Match. I can find the best dog for you. What are two things you're looking for in the dog? I want a big friendly dog. Do you prefer low, medium, or high energy dogs? I want a lazy dog. So a large, low energy family dog sounds good for you. I recommend the Pyrenees. What's that? The Great Pyrenees dog breed's goal in life is to protect sheep, goats, livestock, people, children, grass, Alexa, flowers, Alexa, show me another picture. Sure, here is another picture. I want a smaller dog. So a small, low energy family dog sounds good for you. I recommend a papillon. Show me another picture. Sure, here is another picture. More info, please. The Papillon dog breed descends from the toy spaniels that are frequently portrayed in paintings by the old masters. Alexa, from as stop. far back as the... Bye. All right, so we just went through a lot of detail on how we got this experience out of Pet Match. But think back to the first part of the presentation where I showed that kind of complex multi-dimensional state array. And we were saying that one thing that's really important is as a user, I should be able to drop into any place in that state array and the skill should be able to handle it. In this case, what we've seen is there's a couple of loops uh, where the user is going through and they're changing some criteria so you get some of those recursive loops coming back. But we have examples where uh, dialogue paths that the user is following weren't explicitly defined by our training data. Our training data just had one pass through it and it had one example of show me a picture after saying, uh, after providing the recommendation. But here we've added the additional give me more data piece and we've added the ability for the user to get that additional data in different sequences. So with this, now we're able to support that scenario where we have all this data in context, it's floating around context, we take the user's input, we drop them into that new state, and we're able to combine what the user says and the state that or the items we have in context to provide a result. And we don't have to worry about how we got there, we just know that we have the data we need. If we land in a place where we need more data, we'll request the user to provide that data, and we're able to really handle that multi-dimensional uh, mixed initiative scenario really well. One of the coolest things about this is with all those additional features, we actually still have less code and less training data than the original pet match. The original pet match version, it's like, I think, 1,007 lines of combined code and training data. Uh, it's like 600 something lines of training data and like 400 something lines of code. Uh, with this new version that we just showed you guys, we came in at like 980 something lines of, uh, of back-end code and model training data, which is pretty cool, because that means we got all this flexibility we're able to achieve that mixed initiative scenario. We're able to achieve using information that's in context uh, for basically the same amount of effort. And that's the goal we're setting out for, you know, from the start. Um, in full disclosure, it's still early days with this tech. We are still in uh, developer preview today. Uh, however, there are a couple things that I'm hoping that you all are taking away from this. Actually, show the next button here real quick. First off, um, with this new technology, start thinking about what are the experiences that you would like to bring to Alexa that you found challenging to do today. 
What are the services that you're already providing to your customers through other channels that maybe with this approach, you can say, okay, I wanna map out what are those key use cases, those key dialogues I wanna support, and what data can I pipe into Alexa to support those conversations that might be really, really tough given today's technology. Uh, the second thing is we're actually still looking for partners through this preview. So if you're interested and you're feeling intrepid uh, and you wanna jump in, then there is a link to a, a landing page down at the bottom. You can follow that link and it's kind of a three column layout on the far right column, you scroll down to the bottom and there's a survey that you'll fill out. Uh, and if you're, if you're up for that and you wanna do it, then fill out the survey and within a week or so, probably myself or somebody else I work with will reach out to you and we'll talk in a little more detail and make sure it's a fit. Um, obviously the chalk talk's already done, so that's a bogus slide at this point or the bogus line at this point. But, right. And also, um, do not forget to fill out your session survey Thank you very much. It's been great to be here at reInvent 2019 and happy Friday.